Hey everybody, how's it going? In this video, I'm going to talk about living in Uganda as an expat or digital nomad. I just spent the past five months living in Uganda. I just left because my visa expired. In this video, I'm going to cover cost of living, visas, transportation, finding accommodation. I'll talk about some different neighborhoods where you might want to live. I'll cover health and safety. I'll talk a little bit about networking, making friends. I'll talk about the uh, internet infrastructure, Wi-Fi speeds, co-working spaces, cafes. I'll also outline a few uh, benefits and drawbacks of, of living in Uganda. I'm going to start off by talking about cost of living because I think that's, uh, that's most important for most people. Uganda is an affordable place to live. I would say the average expat spends around $1,000 to $1,500 per month. It would be possible to get by on a six to eight hundred per month, or uh, even under five hundred if you were on a really tight budget. When it comes to rent, a good budget for an expat or digital nomad would be around four to five hundred dollars a month. That will get you a furnished apartment in a safe neighborhood, with a full kitchen, with a gas stove and hot water. Yeah, everything you need to to live comfortably. If you're on a tighter budget, you could rent an unfurnished apartment for around two to three hundred dollars a month even less really, uh, you'd have to furnish it yourself. So you'd want to budget for probably three to $500 worth of furniture to furnish your apartment. But um, that would be a good way to save some money if you're staying longer term, like I would say longer than three months. If you're on a really tight budget, you could rent an apartment in the one to $200 a month range. And that would be in a little less desirable area, a little further away from the city center. There are still safe neighborhoods and, and decent apartments in that price range, but uh, the quality would be a little lower. If you're on a higher budget or if you're moving with a family and you need a larger property or you want something a little more premium, I would say a good budget would be around 800 to 1000 a month. You could get a, an apartment in a premium complex with 24-hour security and maybe a pool and a gym and a backup generator for when the power goes out. On that pr uh, budget, you could also get a two or three bedroom property. When it comes to food, I would say a good budget for an individual would be around two to three hundred dollars a month, depending on how often you like to eat out and how often you like to cook. On that budget, you could eat out at decent restaurants a few times a week. You could go out for coffee in the morning. You'd also have to cook most of your own meals. If you're on a tighter budget, you could eat for, I'd say, a hundred to one hundred fifty dollars a month. You could buy uh, all your groceries on that budget, eat well, and uh, maybe go out couple times a week to a cheaper restaurant. If you like to go out to eat often, I would budget four to five hundred a month for food. As far as groceries go, they're pretty affordable. A loaf of bread is like a dollar sixty. Like a liter of milk is like around a dollar. You can buy a kilo of chicken for maybe eight to ten dollars. A great way to save money on food is to shop at local markets. Local produce is extremely cheap. Like you can buy a, a big bag of of greens and fruits and veggies and stuff for like five dollars for a big bag that'll last you a week. Restaurants are a little more expensive. If you want to eat at a mid-range place like a Cafe Javis or, or a Caramel Cafe, you're looking at spending around eight to ten dollars for a meal. You can get like a piece of chicken and some uh, some chips for maybe five dollars. If you eat at local restaurants, it's a lot more affordable. You could eat on the street for two to three bucks for a meal like a Rolex, which is a chapati with uh, an omelet rolled up in it. it, costs around 70 cents. That's like a pretty filling lunch. Um, you can get a piece of chicken on the street for around $1.60. You can get fries for uh, less than a dollar. Transportation is also pretty affordable. The main two modes of transport are taxis, which are actually shared minibuses, and motorcycle taxis, which are called boda bodas. A ride on a, a shared minibus across town costs around 80 cents to a dollar, depending on the distance. If you have to transfer, maybe you'll spend two dollars at most to get across the city. As for boda bodas, a ride halfway across town, maybe seven or eight kilometers, will cost around two twenty-five, two dollars twenty-five cents. I mean, a ride across the entire city might cost four dollars. That would be like a ten to twelve kilometer ride, and a short ride, maybe a kilometer or two, will cost around a dollar. Uber is also available in Kampala. And that's a bit more expensive. A ride across the city might cost eight to ten dollars. So for transportation costs for a month, it depends on how often you need to travel and uh, how far. But I would say fifty to a hundred dollars a month for most people. A lot of long-term expats choose to buy their own car or motorcycle. A used car you could get for less than ten thousand dollars, and you could buy a decent motorcycle for 
around $1,000. Utilities are also pretty affordable. On electricity, you'll spend around uh, $15 to $20 for an individual. For water, around the same. And a big gas canister for your stove costs around $25, and that will last a couple of months. Internet service is pretty expensive. You can get unlimited Wi-Fi for around $40 to $50 a month, but that's only available in some neighborhoods. If Wi-Fi isn't available, you can get a MiFi. You'll probably spend around $20 to $40 a month buying data. I was paying like around $20 for 45 gigabytes. As for going out and entertainment, expect to spend around $2 to $3 for a domestic beer at a bar. A cocktail costs a little more, maybe like uh, uh, six to eight dollars. Uh, movie tickets cost around three to four dollars. For an individual, around twelve hundred dollars a month is a really comfortable budget. Um, if you like to go out more or if you want to live in a little nicer apartment, maybe fifteen hundred per month would be better. If you're on a tight budget, you could get by on a thousand or even less. If you have a family and you want to have a car and a bigger apartment or a bigger house with multiple bedrooms, twenty five hundred a month would be a good budget. Two thousand to twenty five hundred. I've been a little bit conservative with my estimates that I've given you. Um, I think it's better to overestimate your costs rather than underestimate. But yeah, it's, uh, it's not the cheapest digital nomad desti destination. It's probably a little more expensive than Southeast Asia. I think the average person earns less than $300 a month and um, a lot of people live on less than $100 a month. So if you're earning you know, 1,000 or 1,500 or more, you're, you're gonna be an upper middle class or upper class person. When it comes to choosing a place to live, uh, the three main places where expats and digital nomads will live are Kampala, Jinja, and Entebbe. Most people will stay in Kampala just because it's uh, the biggest city, it's um, the capital, and most convenient. There are a number of different neighborhoods you could live in in Kampala. Probably the, the most popular among expats is Kololo, and that's located adjacent to downtown. It's, uh, that's where a lot of the bars and clubs are located. It's an upper-class neighborhood, very safe. Another good neighborhood is in Tinda. I stayed near there in an area called Chihuatule for a few months. It's a convenient area, it's safe, there's lots of restaurants. I also stayed in a neighborhood called Nalia for a couple months, and that was a little further from downtown, but it's also very safe. That's an upper-class neighborhood as well. A few other neighborhoods to consider include Mbuya, Muyenga, and Bukoto. I haven't spent much time in those neighborhoods, but I do know they are popular among expats. There are some neighborhoods that aren't so safe that expats should avoid, so before you commit to anything, you should go check out the neighborhood and see what it's like. A number of different accommodation options are available. If you're staying short term, like say three months or less, I would say Airbnb is your best bet. If you're staying longer than three months, I would say uh, renting an unfurnished apartment and furnishing it yourself would be the, be the most affordable option. If you're staying for a month or less, you could also consider staying in a hotel. A lot of the hotels are negotiable. If you go in and say you want to stay for a month, you could bargain a bit and get a, a pretty good price. If you don't like working at home, there are co-working spaces in Kampala. Um, a few of the popular ones are Hive CoLab, Design Hub Kampala, the Innovation Village, and Tribe Kampala. So I haven't used any of those. I read reviews and looked at their websites. I prefer to work at home, so I ended up not using any of them. I think they charge a few dollars a day or around $100 a month. As for cafes, there are quite a few decent cafes where you can work. Um, a few are Cafe Javas, uh, Caramel Cafe, Enduro Coffee, uh, and Caravelli. So if you don't like to work at home, there are options. There are cafes and co-working spaces. As far as Wi-Fi goes, it's a little bit hit and miss. At most restaurants and, and uh, cafes have Wi-Fi. Sometimes it's a little slow. It usually works, sometimes not. Home Wi-Fi is not that reliable either. The place I was staying in uh, Chihuatule, the internet went out and it was out for, I would say, two and a half or three weeks off and on. It came on for a day or so here and there, then went away again. So as for staying connected, um, you'll probably want to buy a local SIM card and a MiFi when you arrive. When you buy a SIM card in Uganda, you need to show your passport and they will take a photograph of you and um, they may even take fingerprints. I can't remember, but yeah, you will definitely need your passport. The two main telecom companies are MTN and Airtel. They're pretty much interchangeable. I went with MTN. I, I read that their coverage was a little better, and I didn't have any issues with them. 
Uh, it's also important to note that your SIM card is tied to your visa. So when your visa expires, your phone will be shut off. Your, your data and your calling and everything will be shut off. So you'll need to, if you extend your visa, you'll need to go back into one of the service centers and show them your new visa and your passport. It's also a good idea to get a VPN because there are certain sites that are blocked. Um, for example, Facebook doesn't work in Uganda, so a VPN can, can help you get around that. Uh, as far as transportation goes, to be honest, the transportation system in Kampala is pretty terrible. Your options are taxis, which are shared minibuses, boda bodas, and Uber, or private transport if you buy a vehicle. The taxis are the cheapest, they're also the slowest and the least comfortable. They don't leave until they're completely full, till every seat is filled, which could take quite a while. If you're on a popular route, you could wait 15 minutes. If you're on a not so popular route, you could wait an hour or more. And they're packed. People bring all their luggage with them. It's hot, it's sweaty, but it's the cheapest way to get around. Boda bodas are everywhere. You'll see, you'll, you'll never wait for more than, more than a minute to find a boda. They're fast, they can weave through traffic, they're affordable, but they're dangerous. I was in an accident on my last day there. My driver took a, a right turn in front of another car, and luckily he just kind of tapped the back of us. The guy slowed down in time. Uh, we did get hit, we didn't come off, but I have uh, seen other accidents, I've heard of other accidents, so I avoid bodas as much as I can. Uh, if you're going to take the bodas, I recommend you use the service called Safe Boda, which is basically Uber for bodas. The drivers tend to be a little, little less risky in my experience. Also, they're more honest. The prices are lower. You, you know the price you're going to be paying, so I would recommend that. Traveling by night is also something to consider. It's a little more dangerous depending on where you are. I would recommend not taking a random boda at night. Sometimes the drivers will uh, they could drive you to a, a deserted area and rob you. They could take you to somewhere where their friends are waiting to rob you. So if you're gonna if you're gonna travel by night, I would say either call a boda driver you trust or use Safe Boda. The taxis are safe to use at night, but you want to be careful where you're let off. You don't want to be let off in a, a dark area where there could be robbers hanging around. So uh, you want to get off in a, a populated area. Um, the Ubers are also safe. You can use an Uber at all hours. One thing to be aware of is that sometimes the drivers will try to charge you extra. They'll say it's further than they expected. The boda drivers is also will try to do that sometimes. If that happens, pay the pre-agreed upon price and stand your ground. The visa situation is pretty easy if you're staying shorter term. You can get a tourist visa that's valid for three months for $50. It's easy to apply for online. Uganda has a really streamlined e-visa system. You just apply and you should receive an email within two or three days with your e-visa. You print that out and then you show that to immigration when you arrive and they will place a visa stamp in your passport. That visa is extendable for two additional months uh, for free. So you can stay in Uganda for up to 150 days on that visa without leaving. It is possible to leave and maybe go to Kenya or Rwanda and then apply for another tourist visa and return if you want to stay longer. Beyond that, you'll have to apply for an entry permit. There are a wide range of entry permits available, so which one you have to apply for really depends on your situation. Like if you want to work in Uganda, the requirements are different than if you want to retire in Uganda. And it, it is also possible to get a longer term residency visa if you, if you end up staying in Uganda long term, like, uh, like five years plus. When it comes to social life in Uganda, it's pretty easy to make friends. There's a relatively small expat community, so once you get involved in that, you'll kind of meet everyone. You can attend a meetup and uh, you can integrate yourself in the community pretty easily. It's also easy to make friends with locals. Uh, Ugandans are extremely friendly and welcoming. I noticed that Ugandans tend to be kind of soft-spoken and quiet people. Of course, not all of them are like that. There are plenty of extroverted people as well, but it may take a little, little effort to get to know people. You do have to be a little cautious. If someone's overly friendly, they might try to run a scam or just take advantage of you. For example, someone might pitch some business idea or, or real estate idea. That will probably result in you losing your money. Also, if you're going out, your friends might expect you to pay for everything it can feel like you're being taken advantage of so you kind of got to watch out for that 
dating life is good if you're looking to meet someone. You can try online dating or you can um, meet people around town. It's uh, People are open to dating foreigners. The food in Uganda is also pretty good. Uh, there are a couple of staple dishes you should try. Matoke is like green bananas that are boiled and sometimes mashed. They're pretty mild, kind of bland in flavor. They're not sweet like a regular banana, and they're served with uh, soups and stews. Another staple food is posho, also called called ugali, which is like a ground corn meal that's mixed with hot water and made into a, a mass. Yeah, that's another common dish that's also eaten with stews and soups. Other foods to try, uh, there's street food. Uchomo is like uh, grilled meat on a stick, on a skewer that's cooked over over charcoal, that's pretty good. Grasshoppers are uh, eaten, I think they're fried. I think they're called uh, insenene. Um, oh, Rolex is another really popular dish. It's basically a um, uh, chapati with an omelet rolled up inside. The omelet usually has tomato and onion and salt. So that's very good, cheap filling meal. A lot of people sell fresh fruit, pineapple, uh, watermelon, jackfruit, mango. Yeah, the fruit is, is really good in Uganda. Also, the uh, avocado is great. They have these huge avocados that are like perfect. All the produce is very good. Yeah, I highly recommend you uh, eat your fruits and veggies in Uganda. It's, you can get any kind of food you want. Of course, if you want to cook your own food, the grocery stores have everything. There are big modern supermarkets with all, all the ingredients you could need to cook your favorite meals. As far as restaurants go, a few good ones to try out are Cafe Javas, The Patio, Asian Fusion Restaurant, The Bistro, Canteen Divino, Caramel Cafe, Middle East Restaurant, I, I really enjoyed. Um, there are a lot of good restaurants to try in Kampala. There are lots of Indian restaurants, there are Italian restaurants, there are restaurants serving all kinds of Asian cuisine. You can get pizzas and hamburgers at most restaurants. There's also some pretty good nightlife in Kampala. A few of the most popular clubs are The Terrace, Bubbles O'Leary's, Otters, Cask, Kush Lounge, Illusion. A lot of these places are located in Kololo neighborhood, so you can easily hop from one to the other, or even walk in some cases. Um, Ugandans love to party, so there's <laughs> like a lot of, uh, these places are packed and they're, they're a lot of fun. As far as safety and security goes, you do have to be a little cautious. I wouldn't say that Uganda is a high crime country, but there are pickpockets, there are petty thieves you have to watch out for, so keep an eye on your belongings while you're out and about. Particularly if you're in a crowded area like downtown, or if you're riding in a minibus, sometimes pickpockets work on those as well. As far as violent crime, like muggings and uh, robberies and stuff, that happens as well, mostly at night. If you're in a, a deserted area, it's best not to walk around. It's best to take uh, a boda or a taxi instead. Thieves can hide out in dark areas and, and well, they could rob you. It's also best not to take a random boda at night. You should call a driver that you know or take a safe boda order online. The, uh, the drivers could rob you. That's, uh, that's a crime that happens. I don't know how common it is, but people have warned me about it several times. During the day, robbery is pretty rare, so you can pretty much walk around and go exploring without having to worry too much. I mean, you got to keep an eye on your belongings. Home break-ins also happen. You'll notice that all houses, all apartment complexes have pretty tight security. There's tall fences with, with razor wire. There are 24-hour security guards. Pretty much every property has that. So lock up when you're at home. Lock up when you leave. Occasionally there are terrorist attacks. I don't. It's not like a, a major risk, maybe a, a medium risk. As far as staying healthy goes, there are a few diseases and sicknesses to look out for. Malaria is pretty common in Uganda. Most locals will get it occasionally. So if you're planning on visiting for a shorter duration, I would say it's a good idea to be on anti-malarial medication, like maybe if you're staying a month or less. If you're staying longer term, you probably won't want to be on those medications that long. So it's best just to wear mosquito repellent, uh, wear long sleeves at night just to prevent yourself from getting bitten. In Kampala, the malaria risk is pretty low for most of the year at least, but out in more rural areas, the risk is much higher. If you start feeling any symptoms, it's best to go get tested and treated. Every clinic can test and treat malaria, so it's such a common illness there that they know how to handle it. Traveler's diarrhea is also an issue. 
food hygiene standards are a little, maybe a little lower than you're used to, especially at like uh, street food stands and local restaurants. You want to be a little careful about where you eat and what you eat. Try to eat in busier restaurants and mid-range places. And if you're eating street food, be cautious. You know, you got to use your best judgment, basically. If you have a sensitive stomach, maybe you'll be better off cooking more of your own meals. That way you know the food is clean. If you eat in like a higher end restaurants, then you don't really have to worry about that. The food is food is clean. I never really got sick. One time I did from a, a Rolex I had, and uh, but that it cleared up in a day or so. Uh, also, you can't drink the tap water. I used the tap water for making tea and coffee after I boiled it, and I drank it like every day, but you can't drink it straight out of the tap. There are contaminants that could make you sick. So drink bottled water or boil your water. If you go swimming, there is a risk of uh, bilharzia in some bodies of water, like I believe in Lake Victoria it exists, and some of the other lakes as well, maybe, maybe all of the lakes, I don't know. That can be uh, treated, but it's something to consider, so I, I would recommend against swimming in natural bodies of water if you want to go swimming, just go to a pool. I think the biggest safety risk really is traffic, getting hit by a, a vehicle or getting into an accident while you're riding a boda. So wear a helmet when you're riding a boda, buy your own helmet and wear a helmet. The healthcare in Uganda is not that great. The hospitals don't really have the infrastructure to treat serious illnesses or injuries. It's best to have travel insurance that can evacuate you if necessary. There are a few private hospitals that are that can offer a little higher end care. For treating minor illnesses, like if you catch a illness where you need antibiotics, you can just go to a clinic and get a prescription. Very easy, affordable. There are clinics all over the place. If you think you have malaria, it's best to go to a clinic and get a test. All the clinics offer testing. It just costs a couple dollars. If it comes out positive, they can give you medication right there. So if you start feeling sick, it's best to go to a clinic and get tested. The cost is very low. Now I'm going to go over a few pros and cons of living in Uganda. To start off, the weather is excellent. The country sits on the equator. You would expect it to be very hot but because it sits at elevation, the weather is really pleasant. It's like spring-like weather year-round. There are two rainy seasons. The, the rain is not so bad. It may rain for a couple hours a day during those seasons, and then during the dry season, it's hot and sunny. The people are really friendly, as I mentioned. If you need directions, you can always ask someone. They'll be happy to help you if they can. People will be happy to chat. Another pro is that English is widely spoken. People learn English from a very young age. Most people are fluent. Once in a while you meet someone who might not speak that much English, but you can still get by everywhere. You don't need to speak any other language. It's affordable. You can live comfortably there on 1000 1200 a month. It's also relatively safe compared to other African countries anyway. There's rule of law in, in Uganda. There are police. They take crime seriously. Another major benefit is the natural beauty. Uganda is just one of the most stunning countries I've been to. There are snow-capped mountains in the south. There are dense jungles. There are waterfalls. You can see the mountain gorillas. You can go on a safari and, and see the big five. If you're into hiking, you can go hiking. You can go uh, rafting, kayaking. You can go fishing. You can do uh, cycling and mountain biking and ATV riding. It's really endless in terms of like uh, outdoor activities. And for me, the, one of the biggest benefits is the fresh fruits and veggies. I, I know I keep talking about this, but the produce is just so good. Now I'm going to talk about a few drawbacks of living in Uganda. For me, the main drawback is that the power goes out frequently, especially during the rainy season. Sometimes it'll just go out for 10 or 20 minutes. Sometimes it'll go out for two, three, four hours and occasionally it will go out all day, like eight plus hours. If you're trying to work, that can be really annoying. If you can stay in a place with a backup generator, then you don't really have to worry about it. The generator will kick on and you'll have power. Uh, slow internet speeds are another issue you might encounter if you need a really fast connection, if you're working with big files or if you really need to have a reliable connection for video calls or something. Uh, Uganda might not be the best choice for you. The mobile connection is reliable and pretty fast. The cost adds up. Another drawback, you'll draw a lot of attention if you're not of African descent, like me. I, uh, I stick out everywhere I go, like while walking around downtown. I think I, I saw one other white guy in like four hours. At the malls and in some of the higher-end neighborhoods, there are quite a few expats, so you will see foreigners walking around. There's also a big Indian population, but you will stick out if you're if you're a foreigner. Another uh, issue is the transportation system is pretty bad. 
taking bodas is efficient, but they're just kind of dangerous. The taxis are slow and, and uncomfortable. Uber is kind of expensive. So that's uh, something to consider. Uh, another issue is the air quality. In Kampala, the air is just, it's smoggy. There's a lot of industry and a lot of people also burn wood for cooking food. So I think that contributes as well. A lot of times you can just smell the, the burning wood in the air. The air quality is not great. Another annoyance is that people will assume that you're rich if you're, if you're a foreigner. They, they can t try to take advantage. People will try to rip you off, overcharge you. There's really nothing you can do about it. You'll also see poverty. If you're sensitive to that kind of thing, Uganda might not be a great choice for you. You'll see kids on the street. You'll see, uh, you'll see slums while you're driving around town. It's a poor country. Corruption can also be an issue. Uganda is a corrupt country, unfortunately. It, it, to get things done, you might have to pay a little bribe, like it, for example, when you want to extend your visa or if you get uh, pulled over by a police officer while you're driving, you might be expected to pay a bribe. You might be able to get out of it, you might not be able to. So how you deal with that, that's up to you. It's not the safest country in the world, especially the road safety, like I've said several times, is, is, very, is pretty bad. There are thieves and robbery. It's not so common, but it's something to look out for. It's not like it's not the safest country. That's all I can say. It's re reasonably safe. It's not the safest country on earth by any stretch. Another a couple of important points to go over. Uganda is extremely religious. Most people are Christian of some sort, and there's also a pretty big Muslim population. People are pretty accepting of all religions, so it shouldn't affect you. If you're not religious, people might think they might think it's a little strange, and uh, people will well, they'll talk to you about religion if, if it gets brought up. Also, if, uh, if you're of European descent, if you're a white person like me, you will get called Mzungu, which is basically just a local word for white person, I think. Usually it's used in a friendly manner, not always, but usually. There are lots of kids in Uganda. The country has one of the youngest populations in the world, so you will see kids everywhere. The statistic I was reading, um, 46% of the population, or 21 million people, are under 14 years old. I thought that was pretty interesting. Lots of different languages are spoken. In Kampala, most people speak Luganda and English. All right, you guys, that about covers it, I think. Like I said, I was in Uganda for the past five months. Really loved it. I might go back again late this year or early next year. I only left because my visa expired. I'll probably return and look into a longer term visa, maybe. So hopefully this has been helpful. If if you have any questions, go ahead and ask in the comments and I'll try to answer. If you live in Uganda or if you've lived in Uganda, comment with your experience. Or if you're a local, also comment with your experience. Maybe I got some stuff wrong. Maybe, uh, maybe you can correct me. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.